Hi, everyone, and thank you for gathering together for this time of worship. It's good to be with you. And I don't know if you've heard, but we have begun in-person worship again in our sanctuary. We are so excited. So for those of you that are comfortable coming out in a setting like that, we would welcome you to join us there. Um, we are taking necessary precautions with social distancing and face coverings. Uh, we're doing our best to keep everyone safe and healthy while at the same time giving God our all-out best praise and worship. So wherever you're most comfortable, please join us there in person or here online. We will continue both, and we just look forward to lifting the name of our God on high and giving him the adoration that he is due. Won't you join me as we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to come together. Father, some of us will be in person, others virtually, but Lord, our spirits are joined together to praise and to adore you. We thank you, God, for being the amazing Father that you are. Thank you for the many ways in which you touch our lives. God, our world feels so crazy and upside down some days, and yet we know God, that we can just take each day as it comes in your strength, in your power. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you care so deeply for each and every one of us. You desire your very best for us. So God, today and every day, we bring you our best. We offer to you our praise, our exaltation. Father, may your name be glorified. Yours and yours alone because yours and yours alone is worthy. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father. We give ourselves to you in worship this day in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
There's a really great movie that my family and I have enjoyed for many years. It's an older movie. It came out in 1993. And it was called Cool Runnings. And it's a, a movie based upon the true story of the Jamaican bobsled team. Now, if you haven't heard about it, yes, that's right. That's what I said. A bobsled team from Jamaica. A group of guys got together and they formed this team and they went to the 1988 Olympics in Calgary. It was the first time when they arrived there in Canada, it was the first time that these men had ever been on ice before. Um, they created a, a bobsled, they had all kinds of technical difficulties with it, there were injuries, there were crashes, and everyone kind of looked upon them as if it was just a novelty that they came to the Olympics. Everyone just kind of was like, like, really? You really thought you could do something? A bunch of guys from a tropical island to come and, and be on a winter Olympic sport? Well, then in 1992, um, the Olympics in Albertville, France, the Jamaican bobsled team returned. They placed 14th. No, they didn't medal, but they placed 14th. They were ahead of the United States, France, and Italy. Three very strong and formidable teams. They came against them and beat them. They came back again in 2002 at Salt Lake City, and they didn't medal there. But what they did do was they set the push start world record at those Olympics. There, there's some sort of recording of how fast it takes them to launch and get onto the track and in the sled, and they set the world record. <laughs> this group of guys from Jamaica evolved from this laughable sort of novelty to true, real, formidable opponents, athletes, for the Winter Olympic Games from tropical Jamaica of all places. Their critics, they were saying, who do these island boys think they are? And they watched them evolve. And then they said, who are these guys? Who are they? Well, this morning we're going to look together in scripture at a young man who was just completely out of his league. It was just plain laughable, really. His name was David. David was the youngest son of his father, Jesse. And uh, his older brothers were fighting with the Israelite army against the Philistines. So daddy, Jesse, sends youngest son, David, to the battlefield with some provisions for the brothers and uh, to bring back a report of how they were doing. So he goes and there he finds that uh, there are the two armies. There's a valley um, that is there and a mountain on either side. And the Israelites are on one of the mountains and the Philistines are on the opposing mountain just opposite the valley. And what, what happened there is every day one of the Philistines would come out upon a, a high point on the mountain and just bellow out to the opposing Israelite army. His name was Goliath. I imagine you've heard of him before. He was a giant of a man. Uh, scholars believe, based on what the scripture tells us about him, that he was about nine feet tall, big hulk of a man. And each day he would come out and he'd say, let's just end all of this. Let's just end this standoff once and for all. You guys send me a warrior. Send me someone to fight. And we'll just duke it out. And whichever one of us wins he obviously assuming it would be himself, then the opposing army would become our servants. <laughs> this happened every day. David observes this as he's gone to take these provisions to his brothers. And he says, hey, who is that guy? Who is that guy that's talking smack against the army of the living God? I'll take him on, David said. David? How absurd. David, 
Young David is going to take on this incredible giant of a man? You've got to be kidding. Well, his oldest brother, Eliab, he had heard David talking to the soldiers there, and he got really angry with him. He says, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? Go back to your sheep where you belong. You're supposed to be tending daddy's sheep. You're not supposed to be out here with us. You're just the errand boy today. Don't make fools of our family. David then goes to Saul. Saul is the commander of it all, the commander of the Israelite army, the king. He is over everything that is taking place there. And he goes to him and he says, hey, listen, I got this. I got this. I can take on Goliath. And Saul is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. You're just a boy. Goliath has been doing this his whole life. You don't stand a chance. And David comes back to Saul and says, hey, wait a minute now. I've been shepherding my whole life. Whenever those shepherds are threatened by wild animals, bears and lions, I'm the one that gets out there and wrestles them to the ground and takes them down and protects the sheep. I can do this. I got this. Plus, God is on my side, David says. Saul throws his hands up and says, well, I, I, I just can't even imagine what you're thinking, but go ahead. Fine. Well, good luck to you then. So Saul does then take the precaution of suiting David up. He puts some armor upon him, just this heavy metal getup that he is wearing that includes all sorts of protection for his body and gives him, you know, spears and a sword and all kinds of weapons to work with. And David is so small and, and just so scrawny that he really can't function or maneuver in any of this armor. So he just casts it all off and says, no, we're not going there. This is just utterly ridiculous. I can only imagine what Saul was thinking at that point. What a train wreck this is becoming. What a waste of a life this is. Who does he think he is? This shepherd boy David, who does he think he is? David grabs his slingshot, some rocks off the ground, and off he goes. We want to pick up the story there in 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, and I invite you to break out your Bibles, your devices, and turn there with me. 1 Samuel, chapter 17, will begin with the 41st verse. 1 Samuel 17, 41 through 47. You'll see the words on the screen uh, before you as well. And here we read, The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth so that all of the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. You thought we were going to the uh, slingshot defeat scene, didn't you? But we know that already. We know what happens. I want us to think about today and really reflect upon it and apply to ourselves what it was that David was really up against. Let me remind you exactly what it was that he was up against, not just the giant, but the others as well. His brother, 
and the armies of Israel, they bullied him. They just bullied him when he said that he could take on this giant. His brother said, just go on home, you wimp. Who do you think you are? And David went to Saul, and Saul basically just threw him to the wolves, just sacrificed him and said, fine, so what? If that's what you say you're going to do, then go for it. Give it a shot. Who do you think you are? And Goliath looks at him, and he says, you are just a pampered little kid. Are you crazy? I can take you with one hand tied behind my back. You're about to be lunch, little boy. Who do you think you are? And David comes right back at him. And David says, oh no, you are the one that's about to become lunch. Don't you mess with my God. This is his battle. And he is about to show the whole earth who he is. There is a God. And he's my God. You and I, we know the rest of the story. You know, he got it out. He got his slingshot and his rocks and he, he, you know, and he slung the rock and he hits the giant right in the forehead, knocks him out cold, goes up to him and cuts his head off. David wins. God wins through the power that he unleashed in David. And all went from this crowd of armies staring at what they thought was going to take. No time for this showdown to occur. Goliath was just going to take him down with one swipe. And it all goes to who does this boy think he is to who is he? Who is he? Has anyone ever said of you before, who is he? Who is she? Have you ever been up against such overwhelming odds that all people just kind of looked and laughed and, and mocked you? Perhaps even you yourself thought it was just ridiculous, absurd. How in the world is this going to come to be? A bobsled team? from this Jamaican tropical paradise? Get out of here, it can't be. This scrawny little shepherd boy is gonna take on this monstrous giant? No way. Johnny, and, and you insert your name here. Johnny, you're nobody special. You think you can do that? You're kidding, right? Cause you just can't. You can't. This is just laughable. Who do you think you are? <laughs> the truth is, when God's power is unleashed in you and in I, there's nothing that he can't do. There is no opponent too great for him. There is no situation or circumstance too big for God. There is no thing God cannot do in you and in me when he unleashes his power in us. So let him laugh. Let him mock us. Let him bully us. Let him blow us off. Let him think they're about to say, I told you so. When we're on God's team, his power is unleashed in us and we are fighting God's battle. And God's wins every time. And the world will turn around and say, who are they? singer-songwriter, beautiful Christian man, Phil Wickham has written a new song and part of the lyrics go like this. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain moved. As I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, then who can be against me? <laughs> the big question here is when you face overwhelming odds, 
what is seemingly impossible. And the world is laughing at you and saying, no way, you're crazy. You can't do that. You just can't. Do you experience God's power unleashed in you? Do you experience God winning his battle through his power unleashed in you? That's what he has in store for us, friends. That's what he desires. And the truth is, yes, of course, there will always be opposition. Anytime we're fighting in God's battle, count on it. I mean, yes, of course, it's his battle, and it's not easy. And even though he is the victor and he provides the power, we still have to take our position and we still have to fight. It's not easy. There will be opposition. And oh, it's so heartbreaking, isn't it? But the opposition, the naysayers, the mockers, the unbelieving, the unfaithful, so often they could easily be and often are our family. People in places of influence. People we thought were on our team. Sometimes they turn out to be the ones that say no. You can't, you can't. Who do you think you are? You can't pull that off. They seem to be the ones that question God's power. I have to be honest with myself in all of this as I look at David and his conquest of Goliath. And I've known this story since I was just a little child. Perhaps you have as well. And I look at that and I think, wow, what an mm, amazing, tough young man David was. That he was so filled with faith and so consumed with God's power that he was used of God in this mighty, incredible way. And I think about myself. And, and, and is God doing that in me? If I'm really, truly honest, I admit that so often I, I trip up over far less threatening situations. I, I, I trip up over less giant people that come against me in opposition. I, I fall over less giant <clears throat> life situations than what David experienced. I mean, do we have, truly have David's resolve to stand against whatever or whoever stands against our God and his cause? I think about other places in our world where followers of Christ are experiencing true and real life threats and life sacrifices because they proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, because they carry a Bible, because they assemble together to worship, because they fall on their knees in prayer to him, churches being destroyed, pastors being killed, followers of Christ being taken hostage and tortured, versus what we experience here, which pretty much on the worst day is just a, a mocking of who we are as followers of Christ. I sometimes just wrestle with this, thinking my heart hurts for our Christian brothers and sisters that are experiencing such real life threat persecution. And somehow I think, well, is it fair that I don't? But then I wonder sometimes, maybe it's because I'm just not so much of a threat as they are. Maybe their faith is just deeper and more real. Maybe we just don't face these, these incredible life circumstances with such resolve and such power as David did, as others in our world do today. I guess it comes back to perceptions and, and perspective. You know, Goliath looked at David and, and Goliath said, look at that little young boy He's a nobody. He's a pretty boy. Oh, he's handsome. And he doesn't even have calluses on his hands. He thinks he's going to take me down. And David looks at this, this Goliath, this giant, and he says, well, yeah, he's big, all right. But my God is bigger. My God is more powerful. My God can take him in a heartbeat. 
Sometimes our life challenges today just sort of overwhelm us and consume us and come upon us in ways that it kind of feels like we're drowning some days. And yet when we really get into the right heart and mind and spirit perspective that God calls of us, he shows us that when we welcome and embrace his power unleashed in us, <laughs> that God is more powerful and God is bigger and grander and God can take down those life circumstances. He can get us through them no matter how difficult and challenging and overwhelming we may think they are. God can do it. God's got it. So I ask you and myself today as well, how, how do we respond to the world's mocking, to real, true confrontation because we're followers of Christ, true opposition against God and therefore against us? Do we ignore it? Do we avoid it? Do we try to deny that it's even there and just sort of soft pedal it a little bit, thinking maybe it'll go away? Do we pray, but then never take action based on the answers God gives us to those prayers? Do we delay sort of doing anything or responding in any way, procrastinating, hoping, gosh, maybe if I just look the other way, maybe it'll disappear somehow. When the opposition is real, when the confrontation is there, when the world is mocking us because we love Jesus Christ, do we hold back? Are we stymied? Do we hesitate? Do we doubt? Do we question? Do we even retreat and run back? Or are we propelled, I mean just launched into seemingly impossible circumstances, standing in the very gap for God with his spiritual weapons that he has given and imparted to us, trusting his control over his battle, trusting his purpose to gain spiritual ground in the battle, to make himself known, trusting the power of God himself unleashed in us in the most difficult of situations. Hmm. Think with me, friends. What if, what if during COVID, or really any other real, true life crisis that comes about to us, to our world today, what if God's church was not caught up in all the drama of the crisis, not on the worldly playing field, not just, you know, looking at the obvious that's here, but seeing the larger, grander spiritual perspective that God gives to us as his children, as his followers, and that we're on that spiritual plane instead? What if instead of, of, of being caught up in the, in the lower worldly stuff, that we, his church, what if we stood up and became the united movement of God that he has called us to be? What if we stood tall and says, we stand for our God. We will stand up to you, giant, whoever and Whatever you are, together, united, we stand against you. And it is clear to all, to believers and unbelievers alike, that we are boldly living out of the power of God in us. That we are rising above the heartache, the heartbreak, and the pain in our world. That our, that our lives, they're in the very depths of the grim reality of our broken world. But we are living there and rising above it, doing so in God's power unleashed in us? What if the world watched us living in that power, that power that prevents despair, that power that gives hope, that power that experiences redemption in the very hardship, the real hardship of life? What if we, as a movement of God, were not defined by what we do, you know, the, the community, the world looks at us and says, oh, there's the church. Yeah, they get together on Sundays and oftentimes during the week too. And, you know, if we ever need clothes, we can go there. If we need food, we can go there. If we need a, a place to gather and meet with a group of, of our um, friends or whatever organization we're a part of, yeah, the church will allow us to come in and do that. And if we get in a real tight spot, the church will be there to help us financially. What if, as good as those things are and as wonderful as those things are, and I'm all for them, 
But what if instead of being defined by what it is that we do, what if instead that we, as a movement of God, were defined by who we are? What if the world looked at us and saw how we live in his power in the very reality of the true world that we are in today, and they said, oh, so that's what heaven is going to be like, living like that. What if we were defined by the power-filled people that we are, consumed with worship of the Almighty God, living out God's promises and the reality of our world, and it is unexplainable to the world how in the world we're doing that, except for this movement this movement is a power of God to be reckoned with. What if that's what they saw in us? Because they knew that the power that we were living in was a power unleashed by God himself that would bring victory to God and to God alone. What a different world this would be. What a different church we would be. I'm not talking about this sort of Pollyanna attitude of, oh, all is good and all is fine and God takes care of everything. I'm not talking about sitting by the campfire and singing Kumbaya songs throughout the night. I'm not talking about some sort of mindless, non-thinking, naive, sort of out-of-touch church goer. But what I'm talking about is a real people, surrendered to, committed to, full-fledged, submitted and given over to the very Lordship of Christ himself. A movement of God, a people of God who know that the pain, the wounds, the scars, they are very real and we have experienced them because we all do. Letting the world around us see that our pain is real, our scars and wounds, they are real. We've got them just like they do. No pretense here. And that we too, like they, are living in the raw and sincere and the true reality of life. But God is manifest in our lives. God is intervening in our lives. We are living out his power unleashed in our lives. And clearly, clearly the world can see that this movement is his. It is his. It is his kingdom. It is his victory. It is his glory in it all. The battle is his and he wins so that all the earth knows he is God. Francis Chan, he said these words, something is wrong when our lives make sense to unbelievers. Something is wrong when the unbelieving world can look at the people of God and figure it all out and understand it completely. We should be living in such power of God, in such unexplainable ways to an unbelieving world that they just scratch their head and wonder, how can this be? Who are they? And prayerfully yearn for that themselves. We are his church. And when everything is up against us, the world looks at us and says, who do they think they are? Look at that little First Baptist Church down on Woodland Boulevard. Who do they think they are? It's an old building. It's a small group of people. Do they really think there's, there's something different or special? But when we live in his power, unleashed in us, the world will sit up and take notice and recognize that something's very different. And it's God in us. And then they will say, who are they? Who are they? Please, won't you pray with me? Father, how we praise your name. Father, how we 
sincerely and truly plead with you that you would use us, your people, use us individually and within our homes and families, but also, God, use us within our community of faith, this church family, those who gather together in person, those who gather virtually, all of us together. Use us, Lord God, as your church, your people, your children, Lord God. Father, we are on the battlefield every day. I pray that we don't ignore it. I pray that we don't run from it. But instead, I pray that you give us the courage that only comes from you to stand firm and to stand tall, to stand united as your church against whatever it is that comes against you, whatever it is that comes against your kingdom. And God, even though we look around the world and we see that there is real life threat and real life sacrifice for professing Jesus Christ in other places in the world, God, I, I can't help but believe that it's getting closer and closer to home every day. So God, I pray that you give us your power, unleash it in us in ways, Lord, that we are a movement of God and that the watching world sees us and they recognize that we're not just playing church. There's no pretense here. We're not just acting like everything is good and, and that as long as we have Jesus, everything is going to be just fine. But instead, Lord God, that they see that we have true illnesses. We have health concerns. We have financial problems. We have relationship issues. We have hurts and wounds and difficulties. And there are days when we too feel like we're in such a state of despair. They see that in us. But then what they also and more importantly see, God, as we rise above that through your power in us, and we live on a different level and we live on a different plane. And Father, they come, they come to the place of, of not just questioning who we Christians think we are, who we Christ followers think we are, but instead they see us living in your power and they recognize there is something very special about that. There is something very, very unique and wonderful and incredible about living in your power unleashed, and they say, who are they? Who are they? God, use us to your glory. I pray that in each day, all that we do from the simple, basic routine of our lives to the, the bigger, grander missions and callings that you place upon us, that we live out them right through the hardships, right over the tops of the mountains and the hurdles that we face, fighting the battles on our knees in prayer and praise and worship, Lord God, Also, that this world will know that there is a God, that you are God, and that you are almighty, all-powerful, all-loving, that you are, that you are our God. How we praise you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for unleashing your power in us. We give you ourselves this day, Lord God, surrendered to you in the name of our living and powerful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.